Lord be with you. Today I'd like to spend more time with you preparing for Sunday morning for our worship service, which is the second Sunday of Easter. Now there are certain church, there are certain seasons in the church year that have uh, special names attached to them, and they're in Latin. The one for this coming Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, is Quasimodo Geniti. Now, what does this mean? This is from the first phrase of the intro it for the day, like newborn infants. So, uh, as as newborn babies, and where that comes from is First Peter, chapter two. So, as like like newborn babies, as newborn infants. So, the first thing we want to do is think about what, what, what are we focusing on, on this Sunday? It's the second Sunday of Easter. It's the first day we gather, uh, the, the first Lord's Day we gather after our celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. And it's interesting because this, this day has also uh, come to be known as Low Sunday. Now, I remember hearing uh, one pastor remark that it's Low Sunday because it's the lowest attended Sunday of any day in the church uh, in the church year, and that very well may be. Easter happens to be one of the best attended, and the following Sunday happens to to uh, be poorly attended. But that's not the reason that it's often, or that it has been referred to as Low Sunday. Uh, more that it's a, a focus on humility. And so we ought to, as Christians, even being strong Christians, we ought to remember our, our lowness, our, our lowliness before God, that we ought to become as infants. So the, the in, we're gonna begin in preparing for the second Sunday of Easter by looking at the at the introit of the day. Now the introit of the day comes from a few verses of Psalm 81 and from uh, part of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Like newborn infants, alleluia, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, alleluia, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout aloud for joy to the God of Jacob. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Like newborn infants, alleluia, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, alleluia. So we've already talked about the phrase like newborn infants. <clears throat> this comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. And you'll notice in the intro it that it says long for the pure spiritual milk. And then it has in brackets of the word. Why is this? If you go back to chapter 1, uh, starting at verse 22, Peter says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So you can see how Peter is emphasizing that they have been born anew from imperishable seed. We, we, uh, he was there when Jesus talked about the seed being the word, the, the, the sower scatters the seed, and it's the seed of the word of God, and it is imperishable. He goes on to say that it's, that it's living 
and abiding. And then he quotes from Isaiah, all flesh is grass and the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Now he says specifically to them, this is the word that was preached to you, the good news. So that is how we are saved by the proclaimed gospel. So then he begins in, in chapter two. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So in the intro it in, in the antiphon, that's the, the first part and the last part of the intro it, they put in brackets there of the word to make clear that as infants, we are to long for the pure spiritual milk. In other words, we are to long for the word of God. And that is how we grow, as, as Peter says here, that we grow up into salvation. So that's uh, one of the main reasons that we, why we gather in the house of God each week is so that we may be fed by the word of God. So then it goes into the intro, it goes into the, the main part of the intro, it, and that is from Psalm 81. Asaph, Asaph is the one who wrote this psalm. He was a musician that was appointed by King David. So uh, as we know, David wrote many of the psalms, but there were other people that wrote psalms. And so Asaph, one of the musicians, he he wrote some Psalms and this is one of them. So there's only a few verses of Psalm 81 that are used for the intro. It goes, sing aloud to God our strength, shout for joy to the God of Jacob. This sets the tone for we're, we're still in the Easter celebration. In our humility, we recognize that our joy is in God. So it's, uh, um, Quasimodo Geniti Sunday, low Sunday, we're, we're uh, not rejoicing in the things of this world or in our own power, but in God, who is our strength. And then a, a prayer, as we often hear in the Psalms, in distress, oh, sorry, the opposite. This is actually uh, very different than what we often find in the Psalms where there's a prayer of the psalmist uh, praying to God. This is actually God speaking to his people. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. So we cry out to him in distress, and certainly when Jesus died, all of his followers were in distress, though they shouldn't have been, as we heard uh, yesterday in, in looking at the readings for this coming Sunday. But, but God answers, God delivers, and he goes on to say, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So this is significant because the great salvation event of the Old Testament was the Exodus, God bringing his people out of Egypt, out of their slavery, and that corresponds to the great salvation event, not only of the New Testament, but of all time. And that is the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. So just as God said to his people in the Old Testament, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, we can say that God is our God who brought us up out of our sin and, and our death. And then we see the tie-in with the, the antiphon, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, the, the closing of the intro it, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. So we are recipients, uh, babies, infants, they, they, they are receivers, they're recipients. They don't, they don't do anything uh, to get fed except for cry. And so we are to be like that. We are to be recipients of the word of God and, and he will fill us with his pure spiritual milk. So that's the antiphon. 
sorry, that's the introit of the day. Then the collect of the day is this. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So the collect of the day is a, a, a brief prayer that collects the, the petitions of the people of God. So the prayer of the church, that's the, the big main prayer where we pray for petitions for all sorts of uh, people and all sorts of things. But the collect is, is, is honed in and, and often gives us the, the theme of the day. So we want to look at this as we said yesterday. The, the gospel reading uh, is, is the, sets the, the theme for everything on that Sunday. And so the collect is usually going to tie in with that. So the collect is prayed, in this case, to Almighty God. And certainly we recognize that uh, God the Father, having raised his son from the grave, he is almighty. He is all powerful. So we're praying to him, the almighty God, that to grant us, namely we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection. Now, specifically, we're referring to last Sunday when we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. However, this prayer is a prayer that we can pray any time because we are always celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And so we pray that God would grant us by his grace. So there again comes the theme of humility, that it's, it's by grace alone. We, we cannot contribute anything to this, that he would grant us that we may confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. So what does it mean to confess? Certainly we confess our sins. We also confess our faith. And also we confess the faith in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And as I stated yesterday, it can be as short and sweet as what it was probably the first Christian creed. Jesus is Lord. And we have something uh, like that with Thomas's confession of faith, my Lord and my God. So we can, we grant, we ask that God grant us by his grace that we may confess that Jesus is Lord and God. So he is our Lord, he is our, our savior, and he is God. Jesus Christ is true man and true God. He saved us by his life and by his death and by his resurrection. But notice how beautiful this is also, that we may confess in our life and in our conversation. So I don't know about you, but I, I tend to compartmentalize life. And so when I'm just doing ordinary things, I just think about the ordinary things. And I, I'm not thinking about uh, heavenly things or high and holy things. But think about living your life in such a way where, you're, where you are always confessing in your life and in your conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Now, having said that, certainly we don't need to be walking around like this all day. Um, that's not actually confessing Jesus is Lord and God because God has called us to serve in many ways to, to those in our lives. And in, in doing that, we are actually confessing Jesus is Lord and God. So we, we shouldn't think that this is only when we are speaking specifically of theological truths, but it's simply in living, or, or not simply, but it is also in living as God has called us to live. And as always, we pray this through, the, through Jesus Christ who is God's son 
and who lives and reigns with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So almost every collect of, of every Sunday is, is Trinitarian. We, we always pray in the name of the triune God. And, and even if it's not specifically stated, we are still praying to the triune God. So that's the intro of the day and the collect of the day. One thing that, so the first day we focused on the readings for the second Sunday of Easter. Today we focused on what are called the propers. So there are two categories of, of items in the worship service. There are the ordinaries and there are the propers. The ordinaries are those things that are in there every Sunday. So think invocation, think uh, the Kyrie, eleison, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, the glory and excelsis, the creed, um, the, uh, the sanctus, the, uh, those things that are, that are always in week after week and they don't change. So they're called ordinaries. They're just ordinarily done. The propers are those things that change from week to week. So the readings, the intro of the day, uh, the gradual, the collect of the day. So they're called propers because those items are proper for that particular day. And they're chosen to bring out the theme of that particular day. So each week we'll look at first the readings for the coming Sunday and then the propers and included in the propers also is the hymn of the day, which we're going to look at next. The hymn of the day for the second Sunday of Easter is O Sons and Daughters of the King. And I always think it's helpful to look at who wrote the hymn and when it was written. Now, we actually are not totally sure who wrote this hymn, but in, if you look at the, in the hymnal, at the bottom, it's in really tiny print. It gives all this information. But it says attributed to Jean Tirasand. I don't even know if that's the correct pronunciation, but he was a Franciscan friar who died in Paris in 1494. And he wrote hymns, which were published in a booklet, uh, between 1518 and 1536. So that would be right during the time that the Reformation was in full swing. So, and then there's also information about the, uh, the, the tune, but it's helpful to, to see who uh, wrote these hymns. And sometimes we can look at uh, who they were and, and what kinds of things they experienced, uh, which gives us insight as to why they wrote hymns and, and what the meanings of the hymns were. So this hymn, we can see, it pretty much just tells the story. Now, the first half tells the story of what we heard last week, that the women came to the tomb and they didn't find the body of Jesus. They found an angel. So verse 1, O sons and daughters of the King, whom heavenly hosts in glory sing, today the grave has lost its sting. So it's really interesting, isn't it, that this hymn is, a, is an exhortation, it's an encouragement to brother and sister Christians. The hymn writer is saying, O oh, sons and daughters of the King, brothers and sisters in Christ, today the grave has lost its sting. So if you want to encourage each other, Say, sons and daughters of the king, the grave has lost its sting. The king is whom heavenly hosts in glory sing. That's the angels. And lo and behold, one of those angels came down and was there in the tomb when Jesus had departed from the tomb. So verse 2. Oh, and then each verse ends with alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So uh, again, this hymn is telling the story. There's some things in there where people are not believing, and there's things in there where people are believing, but the refrain alleluia 
stands through it all as if to say, no matter what, Christ is risen. So verse 2, that Easter morn at break of day, the faithful women went their way to seek the tomb where Jesus lay. So pretty much what it says in, in the gospel reading for Easter day, that the women went up went early in the morning because they expected to anoint the body of Jesus. However, verse 3, an angel clad in white they see who sits and speaks unto the three, that's the three women, your Lord will go to Galilee. So it, it, uh, it doesn't tell the whole thing that, you know, G you seek Jesus of Nazareth. He is, he is risen. He is not here. It goes straight to the statement, he will go before you to Galilee. That's what Jesus had promised to his disciples uh, before he ever was arrested. Verse 4, while the women were expecting to anoint the body of Jesus, the apostles were, were meeting in fear. The, the doors were locked. Verse 4, that, that night the apostles met in fear. Among them came their master dear, and he said, My peace be with you here. So he is risen, and this is what he comes to bring with his death and resurrection, there is peace. Now, this does not mean uh, peace on earth as in everything is going to be fine in this life. It is peace that comes from being reconciled with God. Our sins have been atoned for by Jesus Christ. However, one of them wasn't there. Verse 5, when Thomas first heard the tide. First, the tidings heard that they had seen the risen Lord. He doubted the disciples' word. So they all said to him, hey, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. And he says, nope, I don't believe it. So then it jumps to the following Sunday, which is what we're going to celebrate on this coming Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter. The words of Christ, verse 6, my pierced side, O Thomas, see and look upon my hands, my feet, not faithless, but believing be. So as he appeared to the disciples the previous Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the day he rose and said, look, I'm alive. And he showed them the marks in his hands and, and the mark in his side. So he does that for Thomas. And verse seven, no longer Thomas then denied. He saw the feet, the hands, the side. You are my Lord and God, he cried. Now, I think the hymn writer here gets this right. So when you look at the gospel reading for the second Sunday of Easter, and Jesus says, look at my hands, look at my side, touch the mark of the nails, touch the mark in my side. What is the very next thing that it says? Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. So I think the hymn writer gets it right. There's a famous painting where Jesus is standing there and Thomas is sticking out his finger and actually jamming it into the hole in his side. It's a really great painting. You could probably just Google it and, and find it. It's a really great painting. However, I'm going to respectfully uh, uh, disagree with that painter, even though I think it's a great painting, because I, I think that Thomas believed without having to touch Jesus. He saw him and Jesus said, I'm here, peace be with you. Do not be disbelieving, but believe. And, and with that word, as we heard yesterday, uh, from Ezekiel, the Valley of the Dry Bones, and, and, and Jesus' word himself, himself. That is what gave Thomas faith, and he exclaimed, my Lord and my God. So again, maybe he did touch Jesus. It, it doesn't say. It doesn't say either way. But I'm of the mind that he believed without touching him, 
because the word is what creates faith. So then the promise, verse 8, how blessed are they who have not seen, and yet whose faith has constant been for they eternal life shall win. So that's the promise that Jesus gave. Uh, Thomas, you have seen, and there again, it, he, he refers to his having seen him, not necessarily touching him. You have seen and you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now, notice how the hymn writer says, and yet whose faith has constant been. This is a, this is a great uh, comfort to us uh, of this hymn writer because we've all had times where our faith wavers and so maybe we're thinking well my faith isn't constant because sometimes I doubt or sometimes it's not very strong but it is constant remember the Holy Spirit grants you faith the Holy Spirit sustains you in faith and the the result the eternal life shall win so finally verse 9 on this most holy day of days, be laud and jubilee and praise to God your hearts and voices raise. So this is a, a great day of praise, as is every Sunday and as is every day. We give thanks to God because Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive forever. And we know that we live and even when we die, we will live forever. So I pray the Lord's richest blessings upon you as you, you read through the scripture readings and, and you look at the intro of the day and the collect of the day and the hymn of the day and take some time to uh, ponder those, those things uh, in preparation for Sundays.